So we will start with a debate stating the time is ripe for hemodia filtration. And we have two combatants, Bernard Canot from France and Jerome Komen from the Netherlands. And we will start with um, Bernard Canot, who I think is uh, known to most of you, who started off in Mont Montpellier. He has been working in clin clinical research for many years um, before he actually took over a um, position, very important position at uh, Fresenius, um, where he's still serving. And um, he also was the French president uh, of the uh, uh, Nephrology Society. So he is well known for his uh, work, excessive work on hemodial filtration, dialysis, and many aspects. So Bernard, please, you're the first to start. I only saw a slide. So that... And good morning. So it's my pleasure to have this uh, debate this morning about the hemodial filtration. And before starting, I, I just want to thank Peter Kotanko for the kind invitation. Just to refresh the memory, maybe not on the senior nephrologist, but maybe for the new fellows, that almost what I will present today was born here in the US. And this is a, a, a tribute to Lee Anderson, because online production, convective therapy, and uh, hemodafetation, which was wrong at that time, he called hemodafetation, but in fact was hemodafetation, was born in the US not far from here, San Diego. And then, by the way, the concept went to Europe, in Germany and France. So the German one moved to the real hemodafetition by mixing convective action and diffusive action, and that, that was the term hemodafetition. And then we put the French touch by putting the online. So at the end, you see the story. And then now, maybe in Europe, the hemodafetition online hemodafetition will come back to the US. That's the point. So to, what I will do, this is my disclosure, just to put different, I would say, perspective. Just to refresh your memory or maybe to bring something new to you to know what we mean by online hemodafetition. And also, my point is to resist to the tyranny of the RCT because this is something which is fine. Yesterday we had a lot of discussion, but a lot of flows or a lot of cavity inside. I will show you. And what are the facts established with the modification and what remain to bridge the gap, because nothing is perfect. So before starting, I just want to say, OK, why we developed the modification in the 80s? Because at that time, the situation was almost what I present here. So acute effect or side effect of hemodiasis still improved, but still a lot of, I would say, poor quality of life, intradialytic hypertension, and so on and so on. Maltolerance, hemodynamic stress, a lot of conditions who are harming our patient. But again, if you look on a long-term perspective, <clears throat> it's not anymore better to wear amyloidosis, but still we are fighting with a vascular calcification, protein, energy wasting, uh, accelerated aging, cardiopathy, and still the mortality is high. So we have to find some solution. <clears throat> and the solution came from this association of the convective action of the different country continent to bring this technique, which is just summarized on this slide, which is inside the same fetus, mixing diffusive action and convective action to remove large or middle molecule substances. It's not just a generic term. But you will see in a minute, the idea is, of course, to achieve a convective dose who makes the difference. Because there is no magic inside the modification. If you don't achieve the do convective dose, you cannot expect any beneficial effect. And this is exactly what we show on this slide, just to show that the modification is really the way to increase removal of large or middle molecule substances. OK, so this is a working group that we have in Europe to define the modification, so focusing on the convective volume, which is a surrogate for action, and diluted fluid for the ultra filter. Depending on the way of you substitute, you have to make some adjustment. The reference in Europe is post-dilution, but if you do mid or mix, you need to have some dilution effect, and then you have to adjust, I will show you. Easy way, 
And this is just what we are collecting as a nurse or the physician need to collect that on the machine. So this is a convective dose, and you see, easy, liter per session. So if you achieve 25 liters a session in post-dilution mode, you get the maximum or the optimal dose efficiency for a modal fetition, no more. Just remember the different techniques or different substitution mode. Post-dilution mode is 90% in Europe, is 10% in Japan. In Japan, is 90% pre-dilution mode. So that means if you look, the convective dose in Europe, and I will talk about this element, and if you want to match the performances with Japan, you have to multiply by two. 25 liters in Europe, 50 liters in Japan. Just to show you. And this is what start in mind to understand why a modification works differently. On the left side, you, you, you know that if you use a drug, antibiotics, anti-hypertensive drug, you need to achieve a certain level. So the dose relationship effect. Same story for the hemodaphetation. We need to achieve a certain amount, which is a dosing effect, and you see, I will come on this point, that you need to achieve 25 liters a session three times a week to optimize survival of your patient. Again, convective dose is a surrogate, but if you want to move on the biomarkers, one of the biomarkers is beta 2M. So if you measure the beta 2M, you know that the reduction rate per session is almost 70, 80%. Then this is a nice way to calibrate and to make a dosing effect of the MODA fetition. Then you have to measure the beta 2M. This is why we put that as a sort of sur surrogate or secondary endpoint, because in Europe, it's a very standard way of measuring the ISIS adequacy. I know in US, it's not your practices. Now, <clears throat> of course, it's not finished. Imoda fetition per se does not mean anything. You have to integrate that in the, the context of diasis adequacy. So from the left side, you have the diasis dose, which is a sum of diffusive and convective. Part of the diasis efficiency with all these parameters, I don't want to go into detail about pressure, volume, anemia, and so on and so on. And then you have to scale to the patient. And this is what we can call diasis adequacy. <coughs> I will show you in a minute. So this is the first element. Now, I'm a little bit provocative on this aspect. How to resist to tyranny of randomized study? I just want to put this element. Going back to the basics, look, 96. This is the first report on evidence-based medicine, EBM. But you see the guy was very clever. Three components. One is a scientific evidence, scientific base. One is patient value and preferences. And one is clinical judgment. Now, if you look inside the science, and yesterday was a typical example, we just focus on scientific evidence, forgetting the two other components. And this is very important to remember. And I was really impressed this morning by Alison Tong. We have to focus on patient. And this is exactly what is missing in a fetation today. We have to make a little bit more effort on this element. I don't want to go evidence-based medicine to provide guidelines, references, and so on and so on. It's not the point of today. Now, <clears throat> if you look at uh, what the concern about RCTs, I just put some element. It's nothing like a Bible. Everybody has some concern about this, uh, I would say, our RCT. Are they reflecting our practices? I'm not sure. I will show you in a minute. This paper is nice, just analyzing what are the pitfalls and limitations of RCT. I don't want to go into detail, but I just want to insist on one element, practices. Nobody in RCT are analyzing practices. And I will show you the impact. Again, analytical method, validation, generalizability of this finding, cost of RCT. A lot of questions. Look and read this paper. So now, what we do in our city, and you know the story. You screen large population, you select part of the population, you random this uh, population to receive active treatment versus control treatment. Then, depending on the finding, you make some recommendation, and then based on this element, now we know it's not positive. This is, I would say, uh, a significant uh, beneficial effect, and then you 
validate and transfer to a generalization of the population. But there is a lot of concern, particularly inside the development of the study, what are the practices, what are the results, what are the population. I will show you in a minute. And this is certainly one of the best paper coming a few months ago, JAMA. They put in these papers 180 RCT study, and they just compared to US RDS. And you see on the right column, p-value, everything is significant. So that means randomized studies select a population which is not reflecting at all what we get every day. Look, comorbid condition, age, gender, everything is significant. So that means at the end, you want to select RCT findings applied to a population which is not fitting what you get, you get in an RCT. So that means moving from virtual life to real life, that is the question. Then <coughs> I will move on the next. This is what we observe and what is the goal in the modern fetition today to get the beneficial effect on the patient. I will come on this in different elements. Just to show the first randomized study contrast. And I mentioned that a convective dose is a driving force of the outcome. Look, 26 centers, the randomized study, the plan was to achieve 24 liters per session. Only one third of the centers achieved the target. And then you get a randomized study, which is now used to define what are the best practices. So this is a fantastic example. Impressively, the same centers, they selected the center who were not able to achieve the convective volume. They put a protocol, which is I don't want to define, and then show that at the end, if you apply a protocol, to, you improve your practices, either by the time, by the blood flow, by the everything, you can achieve in almost 85% the target. So, study was published, and then in a post-hoc analysis, they performed a randomized study showing that at the end, their practices was not so good for achieving the target. So, now, of course, we know immodification is like all the technique. It's a controversial issue. Why? How we can explain the differences? Of course, we can go into different elements. Now, and this is linked to what Glenn Shetov presented yesterday. If you look, I just put a summary. All international study or active study in hemodialysis are almost all negative. Maybe not negative, but certainly, uh, as was said yesterday, <coughs> uh, not, I would say, uh, really applicable to operation. Only one was positive, and you remember this is an CDS study, 81. So that was a positive study with a change completely in the philosophy, in particular in the US with a CATI over V or one as a target. But what he did not mention yesterday, the mortality was so high that eight years after 89, you had in Dallas a specific conferences to correct this poor action. So positive p-value, you create deaths in a patient and you need to correct this element. So statistical approach is fine, but be careful, you need to get a little bit more critical as a physician. Limitation of the different study in Europe, I will come to this point, certainly, yes. So now we move on what is fact in a modal fetition. I split in two elements. One is intermediary outcome, and I just put in a very <coughs> simple way, increase efficiency, beta 2 m all the substances. Facilitate anemia treatment, this is clear. Reduce inflammation improve hemodynamic tolerance, improve metabolic bone disease, reduce endothelial dysfunction, improve, I would say, nutritional profile of the patient. This is already proven. Short-term study. But it's not efficient, I agree. Now, I move on a different topic. Virtual medicine, that means evidence-based medicine. <clears throat> and then, I just remember you that those, it's a very important to achieve the target and to improve the outcome of the patient. So this is what we perform. And if you plot the different studies, the Turkish, the contrast, Eshol, and so on, it fits perfectly. More you provide, and more you get beneficial effect on the patient. Now, if you look what's happened over the last 10 years, four randomized studies in Europe, and if you look on the primary targets, 
three out of four were neutral or inconclusive. I agree. Only one, the green one, actually was positive. But OK, that's statistic. Now, go inside the study and then look what was the driving force, convective volume. And then I split this convective volume by their side. I don't want to go into different detail, but from 18 to 22 liters, from 22 to 26 liters. And if you look on the different, I would say, relative risk of mortality, all cause cardiovascular, more you move to the high volume and more you get beneficial effect. So confirming as a postdoc analysis that the convective dose higher is always associated with a beneficial effect in a patient survival. This is a summary of the four randomized study, and you move from, I would say, left side, and you see that 26 liters you reduce by almost 30% for mortality in your patient, okay? This is what we learned. And then this is what we summarize just to provide numbers. Limitation, contrast, fail to deliver the target volume, Turkish underpower, French underpower. The only one who was positive and without too much limitation is the Spanish Eshor study, okay? Now, we don't want to stay on this, I would say, poor result. And then we create in Europe what we call a pooling project. And then we take advantage of the George Institute from UK and from Australia. And we went to the way to make this individual patient data meta-analysis. What does that mean? It's not meta-analysis of the study. We went back to the database, data set of the patient. We completed the information till the end of the follow-up of the patient. So it was 90% of the value who were analyzed. And then that was reanalyzed by the George Institute. So altogether, we get 2,700 patients split in emo and hemodafetition. We look on different the style of a convective volume. And what we learn is, of course, if you pull all these elements, you see that all cause mortality is reduced by 14%, cardiovascular by 23%. That overall with a completely new data set and completely new analysis. And we went on a different way. Convective dose need to be scaled to some parameters. Two options. One is on the left side, a little bit body surface area, which is linked to the metabolic profile of the patient, my clear preferences. On the, left si on the right side, on the total body water, which is a distribution of the solute. But we know that majority of solutes are not in the water, they are in a different space, whatever. So we look on the different, I would say, scaling element, but it's always the same. Whatever you select, more you get in terms of the soil, convective volume, and more you get beneficial effect on the patient. So at the end of the message, if you don't make any scale, it's fine. If you want to scale, you can scale to what is your face area or total body water to get something which is comparable. We went on subcategory of patient, and we find that age could be a difference, diabetics, diseases vintage, cardiac uh, vascular history, and you see the result. There is some beneficial of the patient. And then we went on a very cost-specific analysis, and what you see, the gain is only on a cardiac event. Myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, congestive heart failure are significantly reduced by hemodefetition. Now, I switch to real life. In real life, uh, it's difficult to find a way experience-based medicine. And this is, I would say, I selected three national registry. The first one is the Japanese society. And you know that mortality in Japan is less than 6-7% best in class for 40 years. So now they perform this propensity analysis in a huge numbers, 5,000 patients. So they match with hemodiasis, with hemodiabetes, low and high volume. And what they observe, same story, all cause mortality on the left, cardiovascular on the right. More you provide 50 liters convective dose, tremendous beneficial effect on the patient. 50 liter pre-dilution is equivalent to 25 post-dilution, okay? Same story for the cardiovascular. So just Japanese, I would say Japanese patient 
confirm this data set. They make this type of spline analysis. Optimal convective volume in Japan is 50 liters and pre-dilution mode. You can scale to body surface area. You can scale, scale to, body, to body mass index. It's the same story. So there is a threshold value confirming what we observe in Europe. Second, I would say national registry is a French one. Limited numbers, only 5,000 patients on hemodial fetition. Some exposed 100% time to hemodial fetition and some 50% time. But what we observe, again, on the patient level, you see that the mortality, all cause mortality or cardiovascular is reduced by 33 to 34%. Interestingly, in this study, if you look on the facility level, and that's new. The more you provide hemodial filtration in your center, and less your patients are dying in your center. So that means if you combine the hemodial filtration and you are intensified by the technique, you provide beneficial effect in the rest of your patients who are not on the hemodial filtration. Interesting finding. Third registry is coming from Australia, New Zealand. Again, same size as the French one. You see almost 4,000 patients. And what you observe, again, left side, Australia, Look, the beneficial effect, as soon as you start a modal fetition, you get almost 30% beneficial effect. Same for New Zealand. Be careful. The scale is not months, it's years. So that means you start with a beneficial effect after the first year, and you keep the beneficial effect till 10 years, OK? So at the end, we have a lot of information. I agree. So how to bridge? And this is certainly one interesting aspect. Kidney Health Initiative, and you know better than me, a sort of common, common, uh, say, I would say, association of the FDA ASN to foster innovation in the US. Immodafitation was the first choice. So we were part of this element and uh, immodafitation to address and medical needs in, in such kidney disease patients with regulatory, meaning that FDA approved the online the cold sterilization process of the online hematification. NICE, and you know that NICE is UK, very pragmatic. If you look on the guidelines two years ago, what they said, for people who choose hemodialysis, consider hemodialysis rather than hemodialysis in center. So the first choice is hemodialysis, even in UK. So what matters most for the patient, we know. I don't want to mention the song. This is HITRAM, another type of initiative, but you see fatigue, pain, and so on and so on. Same story, same result, same finding. So the idea now is to develop what we started two years ago, and we get a grant from the European Union, a new study which is convinced, and you have the target with primary outcome, mortality, and morbidity, with high volume of affiliation, targeting more than 23 liters, secondary outcome, patient perception. Patient perception with a standard of care, SF12, but in addition, with a promise, which is a sort of, I would say, computerized, self-adaptative -adapt questionnaire. So just to implement something which is linking the effect of the technique to the patient perception with the new tools. So this is running. So what is the take-home message from my side? Easy. If you are lo looking on the uremic toxin, you have diffusive dose, cathiobv, this is a quality control, we know. But on the left side, you have the convective dose, total ultrafeter volume, which is a way of removing large and medial molecule substances, time, scaling to the patient anthropometric. So we have this target, and I just put the numbers. Element. Of course, we know that the modern fetition is advancing diagnosis outcome. But it's a multiple action. I don't want to go into detail. This is certainly the most cardioprotective action to improve the outcome. OK? And so my last message is, of course, the idea is uh, to shift our p value, which is on the left side, to the p value, which is a practice value, and the patient value. So still with a P, but moving to the patient side. Thank you very much. So Bernard, thank you very much for the first part of this uh, controversy 
And the next uh, speaker is um, Jérôme Coleman. I think I don't have to introduce him anymore. He already gave one very nice presentation. So Jérôme, um, you are up now to argue against. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, I uh, uh, also would like to again, to again to thank Peter Kotenko, the organizing team, also to give this lecture to, to you. And it's also quite challenging because Bernard has been around uh, uh, the world of hemodial filtration for, for, many, many, uh, for many, many years. So it's quite a challenge to take the composition. But I'll do my, uh, I'll do my best. Uh, these are my disclosures. I don't think they have uh, really relevance for here. Uh, I must disclose that we also use in a subset of patients hemodial filtration in our unit, uh, not in all. So that might be a little bit of an, uh, also a disclosure I need to mention uh, here. We have some, also some practical experience with it. And what my objective are actually the coming uh, 20 minutes is to discuss and to go more in detail on the potential mechanisms by which the increase of convective clearance could improve outcome, but actually also to take a critical note on the current evidence regarding the potential superiority of online hemodial filtration. And I think actually my main objective is actually to keep you uh, sleep safely, uh, actually knowing that you are not prescribing yet hemodial filtration and not doing the patient actually any, any harm. So, hemodial filtration, based on uh, the middle molecular uh, hypothesis, and uh, uh, it's actually quite a, a rational hypothesis to, to, to perform hemodialysis, uh, hemodial filtration. It's a sound uh, hypothesis in a way. Uh, uh, the kidney actually uh, removes these larger and middle molecules. Standard dialysis, especially low flex dialysis, does not. So, to find a mean actually to improve this middle and larger molecular weight clearance is actually quite, uh, quite logical. And at this moment, hemodial filtration. I must say, it's a safe technique, it's applied, I think the last number I read, 140,000 patients worldwide, and also I have to say that you do nothing wrong with prescribing hemodial filtration. Because there are quite some, some actually some uh, uh, molecules which you do not remove, even not very well, by high flux hemodialysis, which can have, have untaught effects. And actually some new players in the field, uh, and I do not have time to go into detail, are um, uh, free light change, for instance, uh, which are not uh, removed by uh, conventional dialysis uh, techniques. Uh, but mainly the marker is actually better to uh, microglobulin, which actually mainly used in comparative uh, toxin clearance studies between hemodialysis and hemodial filtration. But actually, this whole debate is nothing new. And uh, I looked up, I always like history of dialysis, and I looked it up in the literature. And the middle molecular hypothesis was already actually described nearly 50 years ago by Carl Kjellstrand. And Bernard and I are having now a, a pro-con debate on, let's say, an issue which was already disputed in, uh, in 1984. And as you, if you can read it, uh, it, it mentions in, the, in, in, in this book on 1984 what remains of the middle molecular hypothesis and hemodialysis filtration avenue to shorter dialysis. So actually quite controversial issues and you have to see actually all this 50 years which has been going on what happened actually during this period of time and we still really do not have the answer yet as I'll, uh, as I'll, as I'll show you. This was already shown by, uh, by Bernard, and uh, uh, it's, it's clear and, and it's actually, I think, convincingly demonstrated in post hoc analysis. Uh, it's really post hoc analysis that an increase in alter filtration volume is associated with an, uh, with an improved mortality. So, yeah, but then, of course, there, could be, there should be some mechanisms behind this. And Bernard also already mentioned some mechanisms by which online hemodial filtration might be beneficial. And he mentioned specifically that cardiovascular death is actually, uh, the, the majority of deaths actually which are to, to be prevented by hemodial filtration are by are cardiovascular in nature. So what we would expect actually is that hemodial filtration would have effects on cardiovascular structure and function. Uh, all these middle molecules, larger molecules, which are better removed by hemodial filtration, could have uh, pro-inflammatory effects. They could also affect on, on immunity. So what we might expect, actually, is a reduced incidence of infections. And uh, also, importantly, a better hemodynamic stability. And I'll discuss all of these mechanisms with you in some greater detail. And this is uh, uh, the contrast study. And the contrast study, and I think it's important to realize that the contrast study, although it was basically negative in terms of, um, uh, uh, of, of the, the all-cause mortality, is also the trial with the largest contrast in 
uh, middle molecular, larger molecular weight clearance uh, published until now because the contrast study was the only study comparing hemodial filtration with low flux hemodialysis. So if you would actually expect a great difference, it would be the contrast study, I think. But what happened actually, and it's not that easy to, to, to show it to, you, to you without a pointer, but actually they, 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 they also mentioned it in a subset of patients, left ventricular hypertrophy, arterial stiffness, and actually what happened, uh, what was seen is actually there was no difference at all between hemodialysis and hemodial filtration during the follow-up period in terms of change in cardiac parameters or in change of arterial parameters. So, uh, we have a better cardiovascular mortality, but no effect on cardiovascular structure or function. As I, and with the latter, I come back to later. There's a small, a very small effect, positive effect of online hemodial filtration on systemic inflammation, uh, uh, as also shown here in this uh, slide. Uh, uh, you know, the, the line, the, the, the dotted line in hemodialysis, you may, might see this, actually increases a little bit higher to a higher degree than hemodial filtration. But the effect on infections, which is also studied in the, in the contrast study, actually did not yield positive results. If anything, uh, uh, usually, uh, let's say, all infections were completely comparable, uh, 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 overlapping confidence intervals. The only thing what, what, what was observed as a, as a surrogate endpoint is that the first sepsis was actually even increased in hemodial filtration uh, patients for what it's actually worth, because it's one of the many infection-related outcomes in this, uh, in this study. Then, what is actually convincingly shown, I think, is that if you compare it to standard hemodialysis, intradilatic hypotension, which we learned actually is uh, uh, by, also by the le lecture from Chris McIntyre and also taught you uh, uh, something about that, is related maybe even causally to outcome. And actually most of the studies, not all, but most of the studies have shown a reduced incidence of intradilatic hypotension with the use of online hemodial filtration as compared to hemodialysis. And this, these are results from the ESSEL study. But hemodial filtration has cooling effects. You have substitution fluid which actually enters the patient actually by an extra infusion line. And actually, you can calculate this, but this actually has a profound cooling effect. And this also, and this has shown, has shown in the middle part of the slide, where you can see actually the core temperature decreasing with online hemodial filtration as compared to hemodialysis. And to the left part of the slide, actually, the black boxes which you see there is a, is a, is a, um, a study from Donau already quite some time ago. That if you compare cool dialysis, hemodialysis, with online hemodial filtration, there's no difference in hypotensive episodes whatsoever in this study. And up till now, actually, none of the studies have been corrected, the randomized control trials, or actually even mentioned uh, uh, terminal effects, dialysate temperature effects. And yeah. Cool dialysis versus hemodial filtration would actually be quite a logical comparator in a way, but that has not been performed actually so far. And uh, yeah, we know that intradialytic hypotension is reduced by cool dialysis, and also importantly, as Chris uh, uh, convincingly shown, actually might also, uh, let's say, uh, preserve cardiac function and even maybe brain um, uh, structural and prevent stra brain structural damage. So this cool. Effect, cool, this temperature-related effect of hemodial filtration could actually be quite substantial, but has not been studied so far. And if we look then, actually, at uh, this is also a study from Chris McIntyre, look into detail on st actually stunning and, and uh, mainly perfusion of the heart during hemodialysis and hemodial filtration, you see that actually the perfusion of the heart is actually the changes in perfusion are completely comparable between hemodial filtration and hemodialysis. So we have maybe a better cardiovascular outcome, but the mechanism at this moment, the biological mechanisms, has not been elucidated. And for all um, uh, uh, what, what I could hypothesize, terminal effects could well play a role. But now we go to, to hard outcomes, and I'll also discuss not in great detail because Bernard also already did so, but I'll focus also on some discrepancies between RCT's meta-analysis. And, and, but first, actually, also important to, 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 to mention why not just perform hemodial filtration. Uh, uh, it's a safe technique. It's widely uh, applied. You actually also do not do anything wrong with it. And if, yeah, it, uh, uh, and, and even you, you certainly can improve more, uh, uh, more uremic toxins. But it also comes at a, at a cost. And it, the cost is not very, very large. This, these are results from, the, from the, co uh, uh, the contrast study. But they amount to approximately 15, 20,000 euros over the 
uh, uh, over the five-year period. Not a large amount, but still, it's a little bit more complicated technique. You need uh, more uh, uh, disposables. You need some extra checks. So it, it has some cost effect uh, related to it. This is the study from uh, 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 the meta-analysis uh, from PETAS, which already was discussed by Bernard. I will not go into detail. S uh, uh, sufficient to state that in this meta-analysis, actually an approximately 20% reduction in mortality was observed with online hemodial filtration. But if you look, and, and this is actually, I think, a very nice paper from Francesco Locatelli in NDT, also looking critically through all the different evidence related to online HDF, what you see is actually that there's only one study, the S-hole study, which actually reached significance comparing hemodial filtration with hemodialysis. So this has a big weight, uh, I think, in all the different meta-analysis. And it's not only that... Uh, the, the studies actually were different in terms of statistical significance, but also the meta-analysis which have been performed, and there were five until now, actually were differences in actually in, in observing either significant changes in all-cause mortality or not. Cardiovascular mortality was in most of the uh, uh, meta-analysis reduced, but all-cause mortality, as you see, actually only in two of the five meta-analysis. So also some discrepancy here. And if you also look at uh, uh, a difference on uh, important other parameters like phosphate and, uh, and anemia, there's not really any, let's say, I must say, straightforward difference in, uh, between phosphate control, anemia control, between hemodialysis and hemodial filtration. So, and yeah, looking at real life, um, uh, the, the, the real life experience, uh, Bernard showed you some studies on real life experience where um, uh, hemodial filtration appeared to have a beneficial effect. But this is, this is a real world comparison from the DOPS uh, uh, reported lately. And what you see that whatever the volume is, actually uh, there was in this observational study no uh, significant positive effect observed of online hemodial filtration as compared to hemodialysis. So also in the observational studies there are some discrepancies. Some studies say it's better, some, say, some studies like this study doesn't show, don't show any benefit. And coming back actually to the, to the mechanism, and this is an, uh, an, um, a slide which I received by courtesy of John Dargurdes, and I think it's very telling in a way. On the left you see the contrast study, and the contrast study was the study comparing low flux hemodialysis with hemodial filtration and had by far the largest contrast, if you see to the left part of the left lower part of the slide, in beta 2M levels. These are pre-dialytic beta 2M levels, clearly uh, uh, decreasing with um, uh, uh, online HDF as compared to hemodialysis. No difference in survival. Whereas if you look at the Esholt study, where um, uh, High flux hemodialysis was compared with hemodial filtration. Very small differences in beta 2 microglobulin levels, but a difference in survival. So, uh, uh, and I think this led to the hypothesis, and I think this is also a very, very nice editorial, could indeed be some of the pot potential mechanisms by which online HDF might have an effect on survival be related to temperature. Again, referring to the, this study from, uh, uh, from the group of Chris McIntyre showing improvement in cardiovascular parameters after one year of cool dialysis as compared to standard dialysis. And I think this is really, an, I think, a kind of under a neglected point in all the, the, the randomized studies so far. And lastly, uh, we've been talking about patient-reported outcome measures, <clears throat> and uh, also recent meta-analysis was done in PLOS One, comparing HDF in terms of um, uh, SF36 scale, physical component score, no significant difference uh, uh, between hemodialysis and HDF, and also if you look at the few studies looking at fatigue, no difference, significant difference between hemodialysis, hemodialysis and online hemodial filtration so far. So here also, in terms of patient-reported outcomes, we do not know the answer yet. Ah, sorry. Yeah. So what can I conclude? Um, uh, I think online hemodial filtration is a safe treatment with widespread application. There's absolutely nothing wrong with prescribing it. We also do it. We have no suggestion of inferiority as compared to hemodialysis. But coming back again to sleeping safely at night, not prescribing hemodialysis, hemodial filtration, I think the jury is still out there. We have discrepancies between, even between different meta-analysis. We, we have differences between randomized controlled trials, of which only actually one showed significantly different uh, uh, differences in our terms of outcome. 
we have kind of a discrepancy between the improved cardiac, cardiovascular outcome on the one hand and the mechanism on the other hand. We didn't see yet any effects on cardiovascular structure or function. There's certainly re uh, consistent relations between com better outcomes and convective volumes, but it's only on post-hoc analysis, and there's no significant effect of online hemodial filtration yet shown on quality of life. Most studies showed a reduced incidence of hypotensive episodes, but it might be temperature related, and I think it's very important to, you, to perform a head-on comparison between online HDF and cool dialysis. And also importantly, as I already said, nothing wrong with prescribing hemodial filtration, but it's not a panacea, because we've really learned over the years that adequate dialysis is more than uremic toxin clearance. And we really, if we perform hemodial filtration, nothing wrong with that. Don't forget about all the other aspects, which also Bernard showed in one of his first slides, of uh, uh, all the other aspects of uh, dialysis treatment, because focusing on uremic toxin clearance only might hamper our wider view on adequacy. And actually, I think that the fact there's still a need for a large randomized trial like CONVENCE that shows that regarding online hemodial filtration, the proof is still out there. Thank you. You want to stay up here? Okay, Bernard. Um, so we have now a short rebuttal. Um, so Bernard can do some rebuttal on his strong arguments by Jerome. Uh, thank you. No, I, I agree on a lot of points. Uh, now, I want to go a little bit more on a criticism because, as uh, Jerome mentioned about the DOPS study, the second DOPS study, if you look inside the paper, and then, then need to be fair, one third of the patient, you don't know what sort of technique they were using. Is it hemophytation? Is it biofetation? Is it hemodafetation pre or post? And if you add on this element, one third, you don't know what, what the convective volume applied to the patient. So that means methodological aspect is very important to make analysis. And this is why I just put in this P concept. Practices is certainly more important than the, what we do in a convective volume. Just to look on the inside. So the point is, of course, we agree. Convective dose is one element. It's not diesis adequacy, like CATI over V, it's not diesis adequacy. But what you have to consider in this concept, to compare mortality, what was a blood pressure control, what was a volume control, what was anemia, what was uh, inflammation status. So it's, of course, diesis adequacy is a complete, complete, I would say, puzzle, and you need to get all these elements. I'm not sure we will have the capacity to develop a study considering all these elements. Uh, it's so hard, so difficult to start uh, a randomized study in hemodiasis. Complexity of the patient, complexity of practices, complexity of so many factors. I'm not sure we will have the capacity to show something. I hope that uh, with the convince, we will have the convincing evidence now. We try to do our best for this element, but that's the point. Maybe I should just uh, ask, do you think convince will be able to give us a really evidence. What is, what, what is the design of a CONVINCE? What are they studying? No, the, the design of the CONVINCE is a randomized study. Hemodiphetition versus hemodiasis high flux. Hemodiasis guided by best practices, minimum of cativity, cat mini, and so it's guided by best practices, and hemodiphetition is to achieve in a post-dilution mode minimum 23 liters per session. So it's not comparing Low no. volume, no, no, no. High it's, it's, it's just what we learn from the hemodiffusion in terms of optimal convective volume versus optimal high flux hemodiasis. Same purity of the diazide, same element, just trying to combine or to, con to compare really the convective dose versus uh, no convective dose or small convective. Okay, so we'll see. Any remarks, final com remarks? No, I, I must say it's, it's always a pro-con debate eh, and you have to put in a, a little bit of um, uh, differences between the positions. Actually, I think personally that it's perfectly fine to do hemodial filtration, but actually as part of a spectrum of the whole dialysis adequacy, attention to volume control, attention to, uh, let's say, exercise, nutrition, etc. And that my only concern is actually with HDF, let's say uh, uh, the focus on it is that it, if you look at only at toxin clearance, then it, can't, then, then, then it may, let's say, 
take away your, uh, your view from other very important issues. But personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with prescribing it. And yeah, as, as already said, there are some positive arguments for using it. But it's still uh, really, if you want to prove that it's, uh, it's superior in terms of outcome, I don't know if we ever will have the, the answer yet, because I think also Convince does not compare it to cool dialysis. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I can make a yes, yeah, sure. No, I, I agree completely with you, Joan. So, uh, just to be clear, we have the Convince in Europe, and we have the H4RT study in UK. I don't know if it's linked to the to the Brexit, but we will have two. St we are running two study uh, with the same target: high convective volume versus high flux hemolysis. Uh, just one point I want to correct on the slide from Joan. Today, it's 300,000 patients who are on online hemodilation. So that means we calculated every day we inject about 25 swimming pool IV without any reaction. So that means we have to understand that hemodilation is safe and uh, the share is increasing by 4 to 6% per year. So this is 50% in Europe, 50% in Asia, more in Japan and uh, starting in China, just to give you numbers. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. the two combatants um, for this uh, nice discussion. Uh, I think we will have, well, a couple of more years fun to discuss it uh, sure. <laughs> until convince comes. If we would be cardiologists, I think we would do hemodial filtration after uh, one study has shown a positive effect. But uh, we are not cardiologists, so we are nephrologists and uh, like discussing this pros and cons year after year for many years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Both of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>